Henry David Thoreau uh, was regarded as, a, as an odd duck by his fellow townsmen in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, he was Harvard educated, and yet he lived, as they said, like an Indian. Uh, he didn't want a regular job. He was a very clever man, uh, could do anything with his hands, and, and was a surveyor, and a very good surveyor. Uh, but uh, uh, he didn't want to be identified as any one thing. Most of all, he loved nature and liked to spend his time with nature, so that to this townsman he seemed to be an idler, just walking in the woods. Uh, uh, he worked for Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, a as a handyman. Uh, he would repair walls and uh, uh, do carpentry around the place and uh, uh, dug up the garden and planted it for uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and his bride uh, before they moved into the old manse. Emerson was very fond of uh, Thoreau, gave to Thoreau for his use a uh, plot of ground uh, uh, that Emerson owned in on the banks of Walden Pond nearby, uh, maybe two miles from the center of Concord, and uh, Thoreau liked to go out and wander through Walden Pond and observe nature, uh, the, the plants and the, uh, the uh, uh, wildlife, the little animals he would see. Spring of 1845, Thoreau determined to build a hut on, the, on that plot of ground that Emerson had uh, 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 made available to him and uh, uh, live in the hut for uh, as long as it took to find out essentially what life was all about. What do we really need? and what can we do without? He built the hut himself with his own hands for, for $28 total materials, uh, scrupulously keeping track of it all, uh, 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 cutting down the trees, uh, uh, purchasing a, a run-down shack so that he could use the, uh, the, uh, the timber from it, uh, and uh, he put the hut up, and by July he was moving into it. He lived in this one-room hut uh, with a fireplace, a, a cot, one chair, a desk, and uh, uh, that's about it. And he lived there for uh, two years, two months, and two days from uh, July uh, 1845 to September 1847. My name is Henry Thoreau. I was born here in Concord, Massachusetts on July 12, 1817, over on the Virginia Road, not too far from here at my grandmother's house. For the last two years, I have lived here at Walden Pond on land owned by Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, in a one-room house that I built myself. It uh, cost me $28, 12 and a half cents to build this house. I came to the woods to live deliberately, to front the essential facts of life, to discover what it means to live. When it comes time to die, I would look back and discover that I had not truly lived. I came to live in Walden Woods on July 4th, 1845, in my one-room house, and have been here now for just about two years. I also had many visitors while living here at Walden Pond. Uh, many honest pilgrims found their way out to my house here by the pond in order to find out exactly why I've been living here in the first place. I've discovered that to live my life deliberately, I must follow my own genius, which can be a very crooked path indeed. While living at Walden Pond, I read books. In the afternoon, I would bathe my intellect in the Bhagavad Gita the greatest of the world's scriptures. I would also read the Iliad, and I read several inconsequential books of travel. What did I eat while living at Walden Pond? Well, I grew crops. My first two summers, I grew beans. My first summer, I had two and a half acres. That was too much. I did not read books my first summer. I hoed beans. I estimate that if I took all of my bean plants and laid them end to end, I would have had about seven and a half miles of beans. I also grew some Indian corn, which did not amount to much. 
some peas and potatoes and turnips as well. My second summer, I had about a third of an acre of the same. Beans, Indian corn, peas, potatoes, but also some melons and tomatoes as well. Whatever I could not grow myself, such as rice or molasses, I was obliged to walk into the village and purchase. I do walk into the village every day or two in order to visit friends or to purchase supplies. As I say to Mr. Emerson, when I am tired of observing nature, I walk into Concord to observe my neighbor. And I find that by spending time with my friends and family, makes me appreciate being back in nature and solitude all the better. Uh, I think that uh, the two years that I spent at Walden Pond were two of the happiest years of my life. And I sometimes regret having ever left and wonder why I left in the first place. I find it dissipating to be in the world of men, to be around people too much. I love solitude uh, more than I like society. I prefer to be alone. And to be in Mr. Emerson's house in the midst of the village, I find is to be too much in the world of men. I prefer to be in the world of nature. Since I have lived at Walden Woods, I have accomplished a great deal of writing. I have recently finished a second draft of my book, which I am calling A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. I have also completed a lecture uh, about going to Maine and Mount Katahdin last summer. I have recently had published an essay about Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish writer. And I have also started another lecture about living in the woods. I have been asked by many what my inspiration is for writing. Well, to be in the midst of the woods on a daily basis is inspiration enough. I have spent a great deal of time with man, and they do not inspire me. Nature is what inspires my writing, my thinking, my discovery of myself and what life is all about. Since I have lived here, I have had many friends as well as strangers ask me questions as to why exactly I have come to Walden Pond. Questions such as, do you not get lonely, what do you eat, and the like. And so I have recently started a lecture entitled A History of Myself about living here at Walden Woods. And of course, I write in my journal every day. June 25th, 1847. I learned this at least by my experiment of living here at Walden Woods, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary, new, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him. Or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. And he will live with a license of a higher order of beings. In proportion, as you simplify your life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. I was born to be a pantheist. I worship Pan and Aurora uh, as much as any other heathen deity, and I find God not only within me, but without me as well. In fact, my occupation is to find God in nature, to seek him out of all of his lurking places, both great and small. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. To be in the midst of nature is to be in the midst of God. Nature is just God with his clothes on. Now, I trust that some may be near and dear to Buddha or Christ or Swedenborg as any other deity. And I think that it is not necessarily to be Christian to appreciate the life of Christ and the beauty of his words. Indeed, whether you call it Krishna or Christ, Buddha, the great spirit as the Indians call it, the oversoul, as Mr. Emerson says, 
In my mind, it is all one and the same. God is all around us, and to be in the midst of nature is to be aware how great and how personal God really is with all of us. October is the month of painted leaves when nature has her annual fair to show off what she can do. Every walk is a new adventure as the trees change their colors. First the scarlet oak and then the red maple and then the sugar maple showing off their oranges and their reds. The whole woods seems ablaze with an indescribable fire. Fall is truly the time when nature is really alive. In winter, the world has an impressive stillness. A blanket of cotton covers the entire landscape and fences and walls become fantastic figures, almost as if they are from another world. As you walk out into the midst of nature in the winter, the mist crystallizes on your greatcoat. The crunching of the snow sounds like a thunderclap. The entire world seems as if it is asleep. However, Underneath the snow, you can imagine a subterranean fire. She is asleep, but nature is preparing for her spring thaw when the weather begins to warm. Spring is the time when the world and mankind are reborn. Nature begins to throw off her wintry blanket, and each day brings a new rebirth in some plant. Man himself begins to come out of his winter stupor as well. One morning you will see the skunk cabbage. The next morning you will see the budding of the white maple. The day after that you will see the beginnings of the saxifrage as it comes up. There is great hope and promise in a spring shower when the world itself is beginning to wash itself from its icy grip and begin to live each day and be happy and carefree once again. I am asked if I would like to be remembered. I must admit, I rarely concern myself with the future and I barely recall the past. I am more concerned about living in the present moment. I suppose I call it the gospel according to the present time. Uh, rather than fame or money, give me truth. I have lived my life according to my own dictates and followed my own genius and that is all I could ask of anyone else. I would not have anyone adopt my mode of living on any account. Have anyone do what their father or their mother or their neighbor tells them to do. They should follow their own conscience and do what they think is best for themselves. Any man who follows his genius will never be led far astray. I ask for no statues, no obelisks in my memory. I suppose my life is the memorial to the way I have lived. As long as I do what I think is best for myself and live my life my own way, that is all that I can ask and all that anyone else should ask of me as well. Over 300,000 visitors come to Concord, Massachusetts every year. Few at most ever experience Walden in the wintertime. Thoreau found beauty in nature that today's world simply experiences as an afterthought. Remarkably, Henry David Thoreau's writings in life can lay claim as inspiration for artists, writers, and politicians. So let's discover this winter wonderland in the footsteps of Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau moved to Walden Pond in 1845 and built a cabin there for around $28. 26 months later, he returned to civilization. First published in 1854, Walden, or Why I Lived in the Woods, recorded his experiences there, which still stand today as a landmark in American literature. He kept a journal to record his experiences, kept it very meticulously, in fact. Walden, being like the rest, usually bare of snow or with only shallow and interrupted drifts on it, 
was my yard, where I could walk freely when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level elsewhere and the villagers were confined to their streets. There, far from the village street, and except at very long intervals from the jingle of sleigh bells, I slid and skated as in a vast moose yard, well trodden, overhung by oak woods and solemn pines bent down with snow. When the ponds were firmly frozen, they afforded not only new and shorter routes to many points, but new views from their surfaces of the familiar landscape around them. The first thing each morning that Thoreau undertook was to take his axe and a pail and go in search of water. He would reach this water by cutting through snow if it was there, or usually a foot of ice, and kneel and then drink the water or catch some in his pail. In January, the prudent landlord comes from the village of Concord to get ice to cool his summer drink. He foresees the heat and thirst of July now in January. Walden Pond, surveyed and measured by Thoreau, offered easy access for cutting, storing, and selling ice blocks profitably worldwide. For 16 days in the winter of 46, a hundred Irishmen with Yankee overseers came from Cambridge to get out the ice. They divided the ice into cakes, sledded it to shore, stacked and placed evenly side by side. They wanted the pond to yield approximately a thousand tons, about one acre each day. They would stand these stacks 35 feet tall, cover them with hay and boards, and though a large percentage was hauled away for profit, the remaining ice was not quite melted until September of 1847. The Lincoln Hills rose up around me at the extremity of a snowy plain in which I did not remember to have stood before. And the fishermen, at an indeterminable distance over the ice, moving slowly about with their wolfish dogs, passed for sealers or Eskimo, or in misty weather looked like fabulous creatures, and I did not know whether they were giants or pygmies. Thoreau, like many of the fishermen on occasion, was able to get bait from worms that he got through the rotten logs or axing through the bark. And then he would fish for perch. And as he said, the perch would swallow the grub worm, the pickerel would swallow the perch, and the fishermen swallow the pickerel. A perfect continuous cycle. After a still winter's night, I awoke with the impression that some question had been sent to me as to how, when, where, I'm not certain. The Boston Fitchburg train tracks right next to his cabin and with many visitors from Concord, Thoreau did not live quite a life of solitude as most people believe. On many occasions, Hunters, villagers, and those working on the railroad tracks would often interact with Thoreau as he walked around the pond. In dark winter mornings or in short winter afternoons, I sometimes heard a pack of hounds threading all through the woods with hounding cry and yelp, unable to resist the instinct of the chase and the note of the hunting horn at intervals, proving that man was in the rear. For sounds in winter nights, and often in winter days, I heard the forlorn but melodious note of a hooting owl indefinitely far. Such a sound as the frozen earth would yield if struck with a suitable plectrum, the very lingua vernacula of Walden Wood, and quite familiar to me at last, though I never saw the bird while it was making it. One day a man came to my hut from Lexington to inquire after his hound that had made a large track and had been hunting for a week by himself but I fear that he was not the wiser for all I told him, for every time I attempted to answer his questions, he interrupted me by asking, what do you do here? He had lost a dog, but found a man. Perhaps what moves us in winter is some reminiscence of far off summer. The cold is merely superficial. It is summer still at the core, far, far within. In 1854, 
Thoreau published Walden or Why I Lived in the Woods, which essentially remained unsold and unnoticed for over 60 years. You can provide a dramatic reading of Thoreau. They are drawn to it. It's, I suppose, an extension of their parents reading to them as children. It's, uh, it's easier than having to pass your eyes line by line over a bunch of hard words. Someone else is um, providing the intonation, the accenting, and making it more meaningful. Uh, it's like uh, the difficulty students have reading Shakespeare and how, how much easier it is if they can listen to a recording of it because the actors supply the meaning. There's a section at the end of Where I Lived and What I Live For, which begins, time is the stream I go fishing in. And it, and it talks about uh, fishing in a stream, but then it, it reverses the topography, so to speak, and suddenly you're fishing in the sky. And uh, the stars become the pebbles on the bottom of the pond. And the, if I understand what Thoreau's trying to to do there is shifting from a, a very physical world to a far more spiritual one. And, and he talks about the intellect being cleaver where, when we cut into the heart of things. And um, so we all lie down on the ground and we all look up and they have to, they have to think about the, the sky uh, at, and um, and the stream. So that's a dramatic thing. And they come back, you know, and they tell their friends, you won't believe what he did today. Time is but the stream I go a-fishing in. I drink at it. But while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. Its thin current slides away, but eternity remains. I would drink deeper, fish in the sky whose bottom is pebbly with stars. I cannot count one. I know not the first letter of the alphabet. I have always been regretting that I was not as wise as the day I was born. The intellect is a cleaver. It discerns and rifts its way into the secret of things. I do not wish to be any more busy with my hands than is necessary. My head is hands and feet. I feel all my best faculties concentrated in it. My instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing, as some creatures use their snout and forepaws. And with it, I would mine and burrow my way through these hills. I think that the richest vein is somewhere hereabouts. And so by the divining rod and thin rising vapors I judge. And here I will begin to mine. Live deliberately. He uses, obviously, very carefully uh, when, when he's talking about what his purpose is. The word itself suggests a freedom um, that, uh, that he obviously aspires to, uh, to confront the essential facts. What are the essential facts? Merely essentials or necessities. Uh, we've gone way, 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 way beyond that. And, and so it's, um, it's harder for them to limit themselves uh, to the essential facts, they can understand what the essential facts are, but to limit themselves to it um, is is a hard task. And they and they and the, and there's a moral factor in it as well. He's preachy. Um, he 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 brags as he says, um, "Lusty as chanticleer, if only to wake his neighbors up." Well, I'm sure the people in the 19th century didn't want to be woken up by him. And, and in the early 21st century, they don't want to be woken up by him either. In fact, they, they, they feel that he's, a, uh, um, that he's an overt moralist, and he's putting them down. He did the cool thing. 
he went out and lived that way, and they're not doing it, and somehow that means they're lesser. And there's that antagonism that always comes up. Um, and when they find out that he shaped um, Walden as a work of art and didn't do everything that he said he did um, and came back early, they're just happy, so happy that he's not quite as good as he pretends he is that he's better in talking down to him, almost as if he were their father, a kind of paternalism in all this, uh, do what I say, uh, and, and see what I did, and wasn't it wonderful? He's a man of, of considerable principle, and there are a lot of uh, young people are... are, are young people of principle. Um, so it isn't, it isn't the fact that they are unprincipled, it's the fact that their principles are different uh, from his. And I, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with exposure. They, they simply, they've never, they've never been exposed um, to anything that's as stark and austere. The kind of nature that is represented by Walden Pond in the middle of the 19th century is so foreign to them um, that it's hard to get them beyond simply dismissing it. And it is particularly hard to get them beyond dismissing the, uh, the kinds of simplify, simplify that um, the Thoreau stood for and wrote so much about uh, in Walden. Um, so. I, I find it very hard for them to come to take him seriously. Uh, um, it is an exercise. Uh, they're dutiful. Uh, they'll read what you tell them to read. They're smart. They'll understand up to a point. But as far as any kind of emotional uh, connection between Thoreau and uh, themselves, or what Thoreau did and themselves, they think it's silly, I'm trying to think of the words they use, foolish, even stupid. Um, so it's a, I mean, it, it's a battle, and the only way that I, I ever uh, am able to reach them is to put it in the context of, um, you know, a kind of Green Party message. I find when I read Thoreau that you go through passages of very concrete uh, material and then you get into more of his, um, his spiritual or figurative language and that becomes uh, a, lot, a lot harder. Very few of these, uh, of the students that I teach, have a, a spiritual side to them and I guess that's... Um, I guess that's part of the hurdle that you've got to get over uh, in dealing um, with Thoreau. To a certain extent, I, I, I suppose teaching Thoreau is anachronistic. It's, it's something that's been sealed in a museum, but it hasn't got much life to it. Language in Thoreau is such uh, that it's off-putting. Uh, the pages go on and on, and uh, it's hard for them to distill down um, to certain messages. And the notion of nature, of, a, a, of any, um, even a kind of uh, a moderated uh, nature, nothing particularly raw about uh, Thoreau's woods except for the uh, woodchuck that he was going to eat raw, it's still a, it's a, foreign, a foreign world. I ask them, I do this every year, how many of you have ever fished? Almost no one has fished. How many of you have ever hunted? No one has ever hunted. They would say, why would you do that? And why would you give up, um, uh, Thoreau uses the word uh, necessities. Why, why would you restrict your life down to 
food and clothing and shelter and warmth. Why wouldn't you um, want to deal with all the things that are at their beck and call technologically? Um, I think that that is oftentimes the first thing they think about. Well, if, if I were to live in the woods, where would I plug in? Even though they resisted, um, students can understand um, the value of cleansing oneself, of, um, of simplifying uh, one's life. They don't necessarily embrace it, but they can intellectually um, understand it. So I take kids on a field trip. By a field trip, I mean I take them outside. And the school where I teach is, is, is marvelously rural in its appearance. Uh, go outside the gates and it's suburbia, but it, it has a, a rural sense, a woods sense uh, to it. And we wander in the woods and I, and I try to get them transcendentally about the trees, the river that flows through the, the property, um, and to think of those things in terms of um, potentially symbols that relate to other aspects of their, uh, of their lives. And I think they enjoy that. I, I have them sit and look at a tree um, for about 10 minutes. Now, 10 minutes when you're looking at a tree, everybody gets to pick his or her own tree. 10 minutes is a long, long time. And, um, and you, you see them start to chuckle or guffaw to themselves at, at the thought. And I ask them to study the tree because uh, my memory of first reading Thoreau is that, um, you, um, that, that, that he suggests that there is interest in everything if you work at it uh, enough. And, and his, his chapter on solitude, um, I, I often think how wonderful it would be if I could say, okay, everybody has to go out into the woods at night and sleep there for one night. Um, I wish I had the courage to propose that, um, but I, I, I realize the problems that it would entail and I, I, never, I never have. Symbolism as a concept. Uh, um, I, I always try to stay away from it as best I can because uh, I think for 17 and 18 year olds, the notion of the importance of symbolism exists wholly artificially within an English classroom. It has little value in our lives. And even if you point out the religious applications of symbolism, um, it's still artificial. Um, and so in Walden, when we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the pond and he, and he's very explicit about saying, um, the pond as symbol. And it's, um, it's almost as if a film goes over the student's eyes at, at, at that point, and they, they find themselves uh, so immersed in an English classroom that obviously uh, this is just another one of those uh, symbol-mongering exercises that they've been doing for four or five years now. Um, and I, so I always try and stay away from the notion of symbol, and yet it's hard to, when you're dealing with Thoreau, because he he uses the terminology, um, and and because he talks about um, the pond itself uh, in such figurative language that it's that it's obvious that it is more than simply a pond. It is certainly a pond, but it ha it has in his mind uh, a a far uh, more wide-ranging meanings. 
And the notion of purity, the ice is exquisitely pure. And, and, and Walden uh, at various times is referred to as bottomless. It's a, it, it's a bottomless uh, uh, pond in, in, by which we measure our own natures. The thing that I have not been able to do is to dissociate um, the literary terminology in the minds of students uh, from what seems to me a perfectly legitimate way of deepening our understanding of something um, by suggesting that it has other applications in our lives which are predominantly symbolic. I think of teaching as performance and uh, and the, the performance aspect of it is such that they might remember something of it uh, in, in the years ahead because you punctuated it. Um, there's a saying that you dot, in teaching you dot your eyes with pumpkins. And I, I always try to dot my eyes um, with pumpkins. In other words, make it big. Uh, and bold um, in order to compete for, with all that other stuff that is going on in their world. Thoreau had a, had a peculiarity of, of wanting to look at the landscape through his own legs um, because it changed the norms of perspective, because it changed what one expects to see. Uh, and so I, that's something I always do. I take them out and make them do that as a way of suggesting that this is, um, this is the change that Thoreau was looking for in people so that they could see the world in a slightly different way. And all those words that he packs into his books are all designed to do that. Baker's Farm. It's a very concrete section of Walden, and uh, uh, they they can understand that chapter um, as if it happened today, and the difficulty that an, a farmer today might have, uh, and I don't think any of them would wish um, to be farmers. On the other hand, they don't, they are unable to see the analogy between the work that a farmer in Concord might do uh, in the 1850s and uh, a guy working on Wall Street might do making cold calls for 15 hours a day um, trying to move up in some hierarchy. Uh, that, that analogy is... Um, is, is something that I think even intellectually they're not prepared to do. These are high school students, so they don't really know w w the world they're about to get into. 10, 15, 20 years from now, you, you hope that um, some of what has been kind of inculcated early um, bears uh, some fruit. And I know it does from the responses I get from students who come back and uh, have I've read it in the past with similar um, attitudes, uh, and yet, you know, they, they will say, gee, I, na I now s I see what you mean. Um, and, I, and I do believe that that happens, and, and, and I feel that my, what my job is, is to try to make it big and dramatic so that amongst all the other um, events competing for their consciousness, they will remember this, if only because um, B Baker did something silly, or Baker did uh, s something dramatic, or you should have seen what Baker did today.